radiation emitted by a black hole, and uh, he found that the radiation is thermal. And now we want to investigate the possibility that small corrections to the computational Hawking can restore unitarity. And the claim we, we, we mentioned before we uh, stopped is that uh, exponentially small corrections to simple observables are sufficient in order to restore uh, unitarity. And we were about to argue why this is a very general property of statistical systems with many degrees of freedom. So we'll try to investigate this, this statement now, uh, which is that if you have a large quantum system, so a quantum system with many degrees of freedom, then most pure states look almost identical when probed by most observables. And moreover, not only are different pure states look identical to each other, they also look almost identical to the maximally mixed state. So this is the statement, and uh, you see all these underlined words, which uh, I have to make more precise, and that's what I'm going to do uh, by giving you the derivation of this uh, statement in terms of some equations. So what we will, will uh, consider is a, a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So we consider a quantum mechanical system, uh, and um, it could either be a finite system or you could take uh, a system like a quantum field theory and uh, consider uh, the subspace of the Hilbert space, uh, which is spanned by energy eigenstates in a particular energy window. So in that way, you get a finite dimensional Hilbert space. And we denote the dimensionality of the Hilbert space by n, uh, which we can also think of as e to the s, where s is the entropy. And then, we consider a linear observable so a linear operator A acting on this Hilbert space. Now, this Hilbert space has many different pure states. And what we want to understand is in what sense uh, is the expectation value of this operator different among the different pure states. So uh, let's denote I an orthonormal basis of this Hilbert, spa Hilbert space, where I goes from 1 to n. Then the most general pure state uh, that we can write down is a vector of this form. So this is the most general pure, pure state. And we want to consider the expectation value of this observable on, a pure state, on this pure state. And we want to uh, investigate how this expectation value depends on the choice of uh, the coefficient ci. And what, what we want to argue is that for most choices of these coefficients, this result is going to be almost the same, provided that the dimensionality of the Hilbert space is very large. Now, <coughs> um, in order to, uh, to, to, to prove the statement, uh, first of all, I have to remind you that these coefficients have to obey the condition that uh, sum of uh, ci squared must be equal to 1. And uh, these are complex numbers, so you can split them into the real and the imaginary part. So you can think of this equation as defining uh, a sphere of dimensionality 2n minus 1 of unit uh, radius. So the set of pure states of this Hilbert space can be thought of as points on a sphere of very large dimensionality. So we have this very large sphere, and uh, I mean sphere of very large dimensionality, and every point on the sphere represents one particular pure state. And then we have some observable, A, some operator, whose, expect, whose expectation value we want to calculate on a given pure state. So this defines a function if you fix the observable A and you look at different pure states, this defines a function of this sphere. And we want to know whether this function fluctuates a lot as you move on the sphere or whether it has more or less constant uh, value. Now, <clears throat> so this is the set of pure states. Now, obviously, uh, this result will depend on the coefficient ci, 
So we don't want to know the details of this uh, function, how it, it behaves in detail, because the details will depend on the particular observable. We want to make a, a statistical statement. So to do that, we want to uh, introduce uh, a notion of a measure of the space of states. So we, we will introduce a measure of the set of pure states which is going to be the most natural one, namely, each pure state is equally likely. So this is called a microcanonical measure. And uh, geometrically, what it means is that uh, if you select a particular uh, region of the sphere, and you want to know what is the probability to select the states which are inside this region, then you declare that the probability is proportional to uh, the volume element of that region when we select the, the round sphere of this metric. So uh, we in define this microcanonical measure in equations. We can write it in the following way. D mu uh, is equal to a coefficient a that I will fix in a little bit times dc1, dc1 star, dot, 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 dcn, dcn star, so these are all these complex coefficients which define the pure state, times a delta function which restricts uh, this measure on the uh, on a sphere of unit radius. And then this coefficient a, this constant a, is fixed by the requirement that the integral, uh, the integral of d mu must be equal to one. So by imposing this condition, we can, we can fix this coefficient a, yes. Yes, you can also do it by modding out by the phase, but it will only introduce some overall multiplicative factor. So this is called a microcanonical measure uh, on the space, on the set of pure states. And it's also called the Haar measure. Uh, because um, you, can def you can get the same measure by starting with one, part one particular reference pure state on the sphere and then uh, uh, map it around with all possible unitaries where you select the unitaries of the hard measure of the unitary group. So um, this measure is called either the microcanonical measure or the hard measure. And you know, in statistical mechanics, this is the most natural measure you can write down in the space of states. It's what we usually do in statistical mechanics when we declare that all microstates are equally likely. So it's a very natural measure. And um, what we want to do now is we want to uh, take this observable that we uh, want to study and calculate uh, the statistical properties of this expectation value on the set of pure states. So the first thing I want to calculate is uh, the average value of this quantity over uh, all possible pure states. So the first quantity we will calculate is this one, uh, which I will also denote as uh, psi a psi average. And uh, to evaluate it, we introduce the matrix elements of this operator and we can write this quantity as sum over ij, aij times the integral over d mu ci star cj. Now, um, if you look at this measure, it should be obvious that this measure inv is invariant under independent rotations of the seeds by phases. So if you take ci and you rotate it by e to the i theta i ci and ci star by e to the minus i theta i ci star. So if you rotate each of these uh, seeds by a different phase, the measure remains invariant. This condition is the condition that the sum of the CIs uh, squared is equal to one, so that the state has unit norm. It must be a pure, pure state with unit norm. So this, this measure has this invariance, 
which in particular implies that this integral will, will, will give you something non-zero only if is i is equal to j. Because if i is different from j, you can rotate one of the two guys by a phase, but not the other one. The measure is invariant, so the integral will be rotated by a phase, but that can only be consistent if the value of the integral is zero. So what, what, what we learn immediately by the invariance of the measure is that this quantity is proport, proportional to delta ej. Uh, sorry, what was the question? Say it again. In front of the delta function, there's a constant. Is that your question? This theta i, this is a change of variables. It's, some it's a phase. I'm saying that this measure is invariant under a redefinition of the C's by phases, which can be different for each of the C's. It's obvious because uh, so from DC1, this one star, right? DC2, DC2 star, and so on and so forth. So uh, this means that this quantity here, uh, d mu, c i star, c j, is equal to some constant. Let me call it uh, a small kappa times delta i j. And then, uh, if you want to evaluate this constant, it's very easy. You, you notice that this kappa is equal to the integral over d mu of c i uh, squared. Uh, I mean, in principle, this could depend on i also kappa i times delta ij, so kappa i would be the integral of ci squared. However, all the c's are uh, entering the measure in, a, in an equivalent way, so that measure is also invariant under permutations of the c's, which means that actually this quantity is independent of i, it's a constant, so I can drop this index i. And then I can sum over all the i's to get that n times k kappa is equal to the integral over d mu of one which is one. So this kappa is one over n. So we learned that this quantity here is one over n times delta ij. All right, now we take this result and we plug it into this formula. So we find that the average expectation value of this operator over all possible pure states is equal to one over n times a i i over i, which is nothing else but um, the trace of rho m, the microcanonical density matrix, times the operator A, where rho m is defined as the identity operator acting on this Hilbert space divided by n. So what we proved is that the average value over all possible pure states of the expectation value of an operator A is exactly equal to the microcanonical, to the expectation value of the same operator in the microcanonical mixed state, the maximally mixed state. Yes? Uh, we didn't use it yet. So this is true regardless of the value of n. Just hang on for one minute and I will explain what, what is the importance of, of large n. So this is an exact statement. Now, uh, of course, uh, what we have proven is that, uh, the, so this quantity will have, uh, depending on psi, this will be different, this will have a different value, and when you integrate over all possible values, you get this result. Now, uh, this by itself is not telling you that different pure states look almost the same, because uh, it could be that the variance of this uh, observable is quite large, and only if you take the, the average over all possible pure states, you get something which is related to macrocanonical density matrix. So to make, uh, to, to make this, this statement, uh, to prove this statement above, we need to consider uh, not only the average of the expectation values, but actually the variance of this quantity. So I need to do one more calculation of this type, uh, which is uh, the following one. And here is where large n will, will start to play a role. So uh, we now, we, we now we want to calculate the expectation value of uh, the operator A on the state psi minus 
the average, the whole thing squared, and then we take the average over all possible pure states. Now, I'm not going to do it in detail. Uh, if you want to do this calculation, uh, you need uh, uh, a little bit more complicated integrals of this form. So you need something like um, integral over d mu c i star c j c k star c l. You need to calculate this quantity, which comes, uh, which appears when you take the square of the first term. But it's very easy to, uh, I guess, an easy exercise to evaluate this quantity uh, as a function of n. It's some group theoretic computation. You can also think of it in terms of random unitaries and integrating over random unitaries and computing products of uh, uh, matrix elements of unitaries. And uh, I'll just write down the final result, uh, which is that this uh, variance is equal to one over e to the s plus one. I remind you, e to the s is equal to n, right? I just write it in this way to make it more clear that it's exponential in the entropy times trace rho m a squared minus trace rho m a, the whole thing squared. So this is the final formula we want uh, uh, to emphasize. So uh, this equation is telling us that if you have a, system, a quantum mechanical system with many different pure states, and you consider uh, how the expectation value of an operator varies among different pure states, you find that the variance is exponentially suppressed in the entropy of the system, times a factor that depends on the operator A, but as I will explain, uh, usually this, operator is, this, this quantity is bounded, hence we find that the variance is exponentially small. So this shows that most pure states will look uh, exponentially close to the maximally mixed state. And sometimes we write it in the following way, uh, psi a psi is equal to trace rho m a plus corrections of the order of v to the minus s. But this is the more precise statement. Yes. Say again? What, what else goes like one over n? I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, the average is, is, is uh, the average, um, there's a one over n here, but you are summing over n uh, indices. So this order one. So the important thing here is that this formula is an exact mathematical identity. It's, it's, it's sort of trivial to prove. It just takes, I mean, you just need to calculate that integral and you're done. So it's a trivial mathematical identity, which is true for any observable A. So the nature of the operator A, of the observable A, does not enter the proof. It can be a very complicated observable in principle. The only thing we need to know is that it's a linear operator acting in the Hilbert space. It's just an identity in linear algebra. It, moreover, the Hamiltonian of the system did not enter the calculation. We have not made any assumptions about the dynamics. So this is a general identity, which has a very uh, important physical implication, which is telling you that uh, no matter what the quantum system is that you're considering, uh, it is exponentially difficult to distinguish different pure states. So, most pure states will look uh, almost identical, up to exponentially small corrections, provided that the entropy is very large. Well, um, yes. I mean, if the operator A is not bounded, then, uh, I, I, well, in the way I did the derivation, the Hilbert space had finite dimensionality, so every operator is bounded. So if you want to do the same thing for an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, uh, there may be subtleties. No, there is no condition, absolutely no condition. Good. So let me make two comments. 
First of all, uh, somebody could say that, uh, all right, uh, here we have found that uh, there's exponential suppression, but perhaps there are some observables, A, where this quantity will be exponentially enhanced and will cancel that factor. But I think that uh, most observables that we want to study in quantum mechanics uh, can be phrased, m most questions we want to study in quantum mechanics can be phrased in terms of projectors. And for projectors, these quantities are bounded by one from above. So if you, if you take this A to be a projector, then it is guaranteed that this quantity here is bounded. So then you definitely get exponential suppression no matter what this observable A is, or this projector A is. So there's no wor you, should, you shouldn't worry about the possibility of getting enhancement because of the large eigenvalues of this factor. Because if you want to calculate a probability in quantum, mecha in quantum mechanics, we want to calculate probabilities for, for, for things to happen, right? So any probability you can phrase in terms of projectors. And here we notice that uh, this quantity is always bounded if A is a projector. Now, to come to the second part of your question, which I think is uh, what I'm going to say now, uh, of course, this theorem may, uh, now you can ask, does this mean that there is no way to distinguish different pure states? No. If you know, for example, that you, your quantum system is in a particular pure state, psi zero, you can define the projector, P zero, which is equal to psi zero, psi zero, and then, the expectation value of this operator on the state psi zero is going to be one, while on most other states, it's going to be exponentially small. So if you know that the system is in the state psi zero, you can identify a specific fine-tuned observable that will click with that state, and it will give you a very large deviation from the average. That's why in the, in the slide, there is this almost, most observables. So the statement of the theorem is that you take a fixed observable, which you do not select in relation to a particular state you want to study. It's just some specific observable. And then you calculate the variance of a fixed observable over all possible pure states. If you start correlate, correlating the observable with a state, you can uh, sort of avoid this, uh, this, uh, this result. So, okay, this is telling us that uh, uh, most pure states uh, look uh, identical to each other and also identical to the maximally mixed state, the microcanonical mixed state. So this means that if we have a, a large quantum mechanical system and we want to uh, compare uh, the result of uh, expectation values uh, in a situation where we are in a mixed state or in a pure state, we expect the deviation to be exponentially small. Okay, are there any questions about this before I move on? Uh, let me say a few more words. Uh, first of all, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, uh, this does not require it. I mean, it's, it's a more basic theorem. It does not uh, uh, rely on the ETHs. Um, also, uh, please keep in mind that here we're comparing the typical pure state to the microcanonical density matrix. Sometimes we want to compare it to the canonical density matrix. In that case, the deviations are suppressed by inverse powers of the entropy, not by exponential factors. So if, here it was important for the proof that this was a microcanonical density matrix. If I want to consider a thermal density matrix, then these deviations can be larger. Um, also, this theorem does not tell you that, uh, uh, this is a statement about most pure states. You can always find atypical states uh, where the, the, the variance from the average is, is quite large. So uh, the way you should think about the statement is that by introducing that measure that we wrote down before, we introduce the notion of a typical state, of a typical pure state. And what we're saying is that a typical pure state looks exponentially close to a maximally mixed state. All right, so. Yeah. No, the, no uh, usually in statistical mechanics, canonical and microcanonical uh, differ by one over S corrections. Here, we are finding something which is exponentially small, so it's even better in this theorem, right? 
if you compare a typical state to the microcanonical ensemble, the agreement is exponentially good. Yeah, so if you, if you compare typical pure state to the microcanonical, you're making exponentially small mistakes. If you now uh, want to go further to the canonical one, uh, you introduce one over S corrections. In addition to those, but those are, yeah, I mean, those are sub subleading. The difference between these two ensembles is of order one over S. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't say anything about typical observables, right? I only talk about typical states. Well, if you have a, a statistical system, like if you take the gas in this room, and if you assume for a moment it is in a pure state, and if you believe that statistical mechanics works, then it is a typical state. That, that's the statement of statistical mechanics, that if you have a system, and you want to study its properties, it's very convenient to assume it is in a typical state. And most, time, most of the time, it will be in a typical state. But definition, typical states occupy the, you know, most of the volume of the set of pure states. Now, I, 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 mean, I don't know, if you, are you talking about the ground state of the system? Yeah, and then yes, it's not typical. Now we're talking about, we're doing all of this to uh, talk about black holes, which are thought of as thermal systems, right? Systems with, with temperature. So you, for the low-lying states of a quantum system, this is not very relevant. But we're not interested in those states. Well, since I, we'll be talking uh, about the fastball proposal a little bit later, let me make a remark now. Uh, the fastball proposal is the idea that uh, different pure states of a black hole, microstates of a black hole, correspond to a different geometry. Uh, this theorem imposes a very strong, let's say, condition on that statement because it's telling you that uh, even if different microstates correspond to different geometries, somehow uh, the expectation values of observables that an infolding observer would detect have to be almost the same for all of those microstates. So this suggests that even if there were different uh, geometries for every single microstate, different fuzzball configurations, somehow they should have some universal behavior captured by the maximally mixed state. So there should be a universal geometry. Okay, let's m move on. So we have this, uh, this basic statement uh, that I already explained. And uh, let me say one more time that uh, uh, you can prove the statements just by using linear algebra without uh, assuming anything about A or uh, the Hamiltonian of the system. So it's a very less powerful result. So what does it mean now about uh, the Hawking uh, uh, radiation? It means that, um, uh, well, we have this, uh, this quantum state that Hawking predicted, which is mixed, and we, uh, we want to see what, what should be the size of the corrections necessary in order to unitarize the radiation. And uh, this theorem is telling you that if we, if we can think of a black hole as a typical microstate of a quantum mechanical system with entropy given by the entropy of a black hole, then uh, based on general arguments, we expect that these corrections to the, black hole, to the computational Hawking are going to be uh, small uh, by exponential factors. So in particular, uh, this means that the calculation of Hawking is reliable for the approximate computation of low point functions up to these corrections, but it may not be reliable if you start looking at high point functions, uh, and the reason is that uh, the number of possible high S black hole point functions you can write down is quite large, so you can always select a particular combination of these guys that clicks with a particular microstate and gives you a very large signal. So you can write down uh, fine-tuned observables like projectors on a particular black hole microstate if you start using high point functions uh, between the, the Hawking particles. Where, when I say high, I mean that the number of, of, uh, of particles that you are uh, involving in the correlation function scales with the entropy of the black hole. And another way of saying that is that the quantum information of the black hole is encoded in correlation functions between Hawking particles where the number of uh, particles must scale with the entropy. So the information of the black hole is encoded in high point functions in the Hawking radiation, which is uh, the thing that cannot be reliably calculated by the Hawking computation. Okay, so this is uh, the, the scenario for unitarizing uh, the black hole by small corrections. Yeah. Uh, 
th this is true for any uh, quantum mechanical system. Like if you take a spin chain, a, a spin chain in a pure state, and you want to identify the particular microstate, you need to be able to calculate uh, correlation functions between uh, many spin operators. I mean, where the number of uh, spin operators that you consider is comparable to the total number of spins. If you only look at two point functions, you will never be able to reconstruct the microstate. So we, we expect the same to be true for the black hole. Well, yeah. Yes. Um, this is also important. For example, uh, as we will see later, um, uh, in ADSFT, where we can make it more clear, we can define those ensembles more clearly, uh, even if you take the black hole to be in the microcanonical ensemble, which you can do in ADSFT because uh, the system is in a, in a box, right? Uh, you can see that even though the state is in the microcanonical ensemble, fundamentally, the quantum fields around the black hole are thermally populated. So uh, th th this issue is not, is not so important, but maybe it will become clearer uh, tomorrow when we will talk about black holes in ADSFT. Yes. Uh, can you say it one more time a bit louder? Yes. You're asking me uh, when do we apply this relation? The bottom one? Uh, yeah, yeah, so yes, both of these relations you can think of, you can apply them after the black hole has evaporated and you just have this cloud of radiation flying out. So we guess this Hilbert space in that context would be the Hilbert space of the Hawking radiation. And in that Hilbert space, Hawking predicted that the final state is mixed while we want to see, uh, well, what would happen if the state had been pure? Yes. No, you, you, so the question was, how do we see that uh, the information is encoded in this, in this S black hole, black hole point functions? I should have emphasized that uh, it's encoded not in a single, I mean, not just in one uh, correlation function of many photons, but in the totality of all possible correlation functions with S black hole points. So you don't see it directly from that theorem, but uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can convince yourself that if you look at all possible products of operators in this Hilbert space, uh, where the number of operators scales like the entropy, you can find a complete basis of operators. So in particular, any projector, you, any, any projector you want to construct, you can make it out of those guys. So in particular, you can make the projector on the microstate, psi zero, and then you can check whether you get one as the expectation value or not. And you can repeat the same process for all possible microstates. And then you can finally, after a lot of calculations, you can identify the microstate. But you cannot do the same thing with two-point functions. That, that's what I was saying. OK, so uh, let me also mention one more uh, result, which is of the similar flavor. Uh, so it's a result in quantum statistical mechanics. So this, this result here uh, told us how different the expectation values are in a pure state versus a mixed state. And uh, another, uh, so now we want to assume that the Hawking radiation is, is in a pure state. And we want to understand the pattern of entanglement between the different uh, Hawking particles. So we have uh, many Hawking particles uh, after the black hole has evaporated. And uh, they are in a pure state. If you take all of them at once, they are in a pure state. However, each one of those, if you look at it individually, it seems to be in a mixed state. It seems to be thermal. Uh, that's perfectly consistent, right? That's what we try to argue there. That, uh, uh, it could be that uh, expectation values of observables are very close to the maximally mixed ones, even though the state is pure. Now, uh, what uh, Pays uh, analyzed was the following question. Suppose we have a system with many degrees of freedom, and we divide it in two parts. So here we have plotted this big system, uh, and we have selected a subsystem A. B is defined as a complement. So we have a large system, A times B, and we imagine that the whole thing is in a typical pure state psi. 
So typical is precisely what I already defined. So you define the notion of typicality by using the hard measure. So what uh, Page did is he considered this setup and then he asked the following question. Suppose we assume that the full system is in a pure state and we want to calculate to consider the reduced density matrix of, this, of the small system. Uh, and uh, it's an easy exercise to do using these techniques. And what you found is that if um, uh, this, this system is, is, is small enough, then uh, uh, this density matrix is very close to the maximally mixed one. And uh, if you calculate in particular the entanglement entropy of the system, on, of the subsystem on a typical pure state, you find that it's proportional to uh, the logarithm of the dimensionality of the system. So uh, this is telling you basically that uh, if you take a, a big system and you divide two parts and you start making this guy bigger and bigger, you find that the entanglement entropy of the subsystem starts to increase with the size of the subsystem. However, uh, this calculation that Page did is reliable only in the limit where A is small compared to B. Uh, when the size of the two systems start, starts to become comparable, then uh, certain corrections uh, that were ignored in this calculation start to become important. And in particular, you can see that, um, well, uh, I don't know if you, if Tadasi already talked about it, but if you have a bipartite system in a pure state, the entanglement entropy of A, a is equal to entanglement entropy of B, right? So if we start making this guy A bigger and bigger and bigger, and at some point, if A becomes larger than B, then B will start to play the role of a small system. So the behavior of the entanglement entropy has to be sort of symmetric around the midpoint. And then what Page conjectured is that uh, the, if you plot the entanglement entropy of the subsystem A as a function of the size, you get this curve which goes up, up to the midpoint and then starts to go down again. So this is called the Page curve. And um, then uh, we, if we apply this idea to the black hole, uh, what we expect is that as we start collecting the Hawking particles, uh, in the beginning, the entanglement entropy will keep increasing, whether the process is unitary or not. Then, uh, if the evaporation is unitary, we expect that the entanglement entropy of the Hawking particles will start to decrease, and eventually it will go to zero uh, when the black hole has completely evaporated, contrary to what Hawking computed, uh, where the entanglement entropy keeps inc increasing forever. So, uh, this point uh, in the middle of the evaporation is called the page time. Uh, so, this is a point where the black hole has uh, emitted uh, half of the particles that it's going to emit. It has lost half of, half of its entropy. And uh, we can see from this diagram that uh, in the beginning, uh, the Hawking results and the exact results seem to coincide, which means that the black hole does not emit any information. The, the, state, the, the, the state of the Hawking particles is uh, almost the same as the thermal one. And only after the midpoint, you start to see a difference. So you start to see that the entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation starts to go down, which is a signal that the state is actually pure. So in that sense, the information of the black hole starts to come out only after the midpoint of the evaporation. So sometimes we will also call these uh, black holes young black holes and these old black holes, those that are after page time. You can also check the following thing. Um, uh, if you have a, a, a big system and you divide two parts, let's say you divide it in these two parts, and uh, you take, let's say, one of these qubits, which is in neither of the two parts, you take this guy, and if you take uh, the system to be in a typical pure state, then this system will be mostly entangled with the larger of the two Hilbert spaces. This is what follows based on similar arguments where you integrate over all possible pure states to calculate the average entanglement and mutual information and so on and so forth. So uh, what this means is that uh, during the black hole evaporation, uh, at the early stages, we have two Hilbert spaces. We have the Hilbert space of the black hole, and we have the Hilbert space of the radiation which was emitted er in the past. So in the beginning, this Hilbert space is larger than that one because there are a few particles here, and this is a big black hole. So any new Hawking particle that is emitted, based on this analysis, this new particle is going to be mostly entangled with a black hole. 
because it represents the larger part of the Hilbert space. So before phase time, any new Hawking particle which is emitted is mostly entangled with the remaining black hole. However, after phase time, where the black hole has lost half of its entropy, the size of the Hilbert space of the radiation is larger. So any new Hawking particle is going to be more entangled with the earlier radiation. So there's a flip in the entanglement of the Hawking particles depending on whether you are before or after the phase time. Okay. Uh, I think I don't have the time to explain this. Maybe during the discussions I will talk about it. All right, so we have this uh, scenario of, uh, of unitarizing the, the black hole uh, by these small corrections, uh, but uh, there are some uh, additional problems that we have to, 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 to deal with. And uh, a, a very simple way to phrase these problems is in terms of this paradox, which is called quantum cloning of the nice on nice slices. So here we, we assume that the previous scenario of unitarization by small corrections is, 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 is true. And we want to see uh, whether it leads to any other inconsistencies. And in particular, there's this very simple thought experiment which seems to lead to a contradiction. So we imagine that the black hole evaporation is unitary and that, uh, uh, for example, if you throw something to the black hole, then the information on this qubit is going to be encoded somewhere in the Hawking radiation. Now, the point is that uh, on this geometry of the black hole, it is possible to select a set of space-like slices, which are called nice slices, which have the property that they intersect at the same time the qubits that you threw in at early times in the black hole, and also uh, most of the Hawking radiation which is emitted in the future. The way this is possible is by taking the slice and sort of bending it, bo boosting it outside the horizon, making it move parallel to the horizon, while making sure that the slice is always space-like. And you can verify, you can write it down explicitly uh, some uh, uh, limits. Uh, you can verify that this is indeed a, a good space-like slice which can extend very far in the future and capture most of the Hawking radiation. Moreover, the reason it's called a nice slice, nice, is uh, you can check that the curvature on this slice, both the intrinsic and the extrinsic curvature is, is low everywhere. And uh, all particles on this slice, like the star, the qubit that you sent in, and the Hawking radiation are moving with velocities which are not too high. So you would naively expect that effective field theory should be reliable on this slice. And what I mean by that is you can foliate your space time by a set of these slices, right? So you have this Penrose diagram, and you can uh, take a foliation which is this slice together with the next one, and the next one, and so on and so forth. And you can make sure that these slices do not uh, approach the singularity, uh, but they still stretch out and capture more and more of the Hawking radiation. So it is expected that, uh, according to effective field theory, that we should be able to do uh, a calculation on the slices by starting with some initial state and then pushing it forward using the Hamiltonian. However, uh, here's the problem. Uh, the problem is that if you, if you send a qubit uh, into the black hole, uh, it is captured on this slice at this point in the interior of the black hole, uh, but also at the same time it is captured in the outgoing radiation uh, if we assume that radiation is unitary. And uh, this is something which uh, is problematic because it leads to duplication of quantum information and this is not allowed by the no cloning theorem of quantum mechanics. So let me remind you that uh, linearity of quantum mechanics does not allow us to have an evolution of a system where you take the state psi and you evolve it into uh, psi, tensor psi. So it is impossible to you know, come up with a physical system or a device that takes us and inputs a state psi and reproduces two copies of the state regardless of the choice of psi. So that's not possible. And the way to see that is, uh, is very simple. Suppose we could do this. Uh, then we could start uh, with a state A and get the state A. A. The state B would give us B times B. Now, if you apply uh, linearity of quantum mechanics, the fact that time evolution in quantum mechanics is linear, uh, you can use a superposition principle, and then that would predict that the state A plus B 
must be equal to this state plus that state. So linearity would predict that A plus B goes to A A plus B B. On the other hand, the rule that we came up with would imply that A plus B has to go to A plus B tensor product A plus B. And these two states are not the same because of the cross terms. So this is what you get from linearity of quantum mechanics. This is what you get by imposing uh, the condition that you have some device which can clone any state. So this type of cloning is not allowed in quantum mechanics. It violates linearity. And uh, this, this uh, geometry seems to be able to, uh, to do cloning, right? Because you send this particle and it produces a second copy on the other part of this, uh, on the output of radiation. Now, this, this paradox highlights the importance of the black hole interior in formulating the information paradox. Uh, if you have a star, uh, and if you throw something into a star, you do not run into a paradox of this type because there is no smooth and empty interior where you can sort of stretch your slice and make it go in and have the information at two different places at the same time. So this type of paradox arises precisely because the black hole has a smooth interior and uh, it, as we will explain later, it, it, uh, it, it, ma it makes it clear that the information paradox is difficult to resolve if we insist on uh, preserving the smoothness of the interior of the black hole. Yeah. Are you, are you asking whether it is an exact copy? Yeah. Well, No, I'm saying that if evaporation is unitary, then it means that whatever information you send into the black hole has to be contained somewhere in the Hopkins radiation, right? No, no, uh, no, not necessarily. So this is not a precise paradox that can be a, a statement that can be applied here. This is a much more complicated system. Here, I only wanted to mention to you what is the no cloning theorem of quantum mechanics. But if you work it out, you, you run into sim similar paradoxes if you simply assume that this quantum information is encoded somewhere in this Hawking radiation, even if it is in a scrambled form. There's nothing, uh, well, the black hole evaporates, right? So there's nothing left behind. So everything that, I mean, if evaporation is unitary, then anything that falls in has to get out. Okay, so the usual, uh, so an, an old idea of how to resolve this paradox uh, goes under the name of black hole complementarity, uh, which was developed uh, by these authors. And it is the idea that uh, this paradox um, can be resolved by, by assuming that uh, uh, it, that in quantum gravity, it is not possible to factorize the Hilbert space into the interior and the exterior, into different factors. So why is that a resolution? Uh, well, uh, we, we run into this paradox by assuming that we start with some Hilbert space and then we produce a, a copy of this uh, qubit on two different Hilbert spaces, which is a direct product. Now, if this is not the case, then the, the paradox is not there anymore. And uh, the way that this was motivated in the beginning was that, uh, okay, maybe you have these two co copies of the quantum information, but uh, there is no observer who can see both of them. Because the guy who falls in and detects this, this particle is no longer able to get out and verify that there's a second copy. And also, the guy who uh, extracts the information from the Hawking radiation is no longer able to go inside and capture this qubit. So the initial idea was that there was no single observer that can detect both copies. So even if there's some sort of cloning, nobody can see it. So maybe it's not longer a paradox. But the more precise statement, which I already mentioned, is that, is that uh, the, contrary to what effect field theory suggests, so effect field theory suggests that this region is space-like to that region, so we should be able to factorize the Hilbert space. Uh, then uh, the idea of complementarity is that in quantum gravity, this factorization is no longer correct. And in fact, uh, the interior uh, Hilbert space should be thought of as uh, being uh, somehow encoded in a scrambled form in the exterior Hilbert space. Now, 
Uh, this would resolve this cloning paradox, but uh, there are two issues. Uh, first of all, uh, it's not very precise mathematically, so we would like to have some specific mathematical model where this idea is realized. And second, it's not, if you start identifying the Hilbert space of the interior with the Hilbert space of the exterior, uh, it's not, not clear a priori whether uh, this is consistent with effective field theory. Uh, because uh, if you identify uh, these Hilbert spaces, if there's overlap between these Hilbert spaces, what it means is that operators here will not commute with operators in the exterior. And in particular, uh, you could try to use this, uh, this non-vanishing commutator to send information from the interior to the exterior or vice versa, superluminal uh, information, and that might lead to violations of effective field theory. So a priori, it's not clear whether this idea uh, can make sense. Uh, so we will come back to these points uh, during the last, uh, uh, my last lecture, but uh, here I want to mention this, uh, this old proposal uh, of how to resolve this quantum cloning paradox. So can yeah. Uh, the last part? Um, yeah, so, uh, so here the proposal is that the, I mean, this is a space-like slice, and this segment here is space-like relative to that one. So in quantum field theory, naively, you would say, uh, I can factorize the Hilbert space into this part, tensor the other part. The proposal of a black hole complementarity is that in quantum gravity, this is not possible, so fundamentally, the Hilbert space does not factorize into these two regions, even though it looks like it does from the point of view of low energy effective field theory. But what I said later was that uh, two problems with this idea is that, first of all, it's not precise, right? These are just words that I'm saying now. So it would be nice if we could find a concrete mathematical model where this is realized. And I will try to do it uh, during the last lecture. Uh, second, uh, if you start making this identification of the Hilbert space, of regions which are very far away, there is a danger that you will violate effective field theory in a dramatic way, right? For example, you would be able to communicate, two observers would be able to communicate superluminally, like within effective field theory. That would not be acceptable. It would be a violation of locality uh, at the level of effective field theory, which we don't want to have. So it's not trivial to show that this kind of idea can be implemented in a consistent way with quantum field theory. Okay, anyway, so this was the old story. Uh, um, this we can discuss maybe during the discussion session if we have time. Um, but what uh, was realized recently is that there's one more problem with this idea of complementarity, uh, which has to do with this uh, uh, properties of entanglement that I discussed before. So remember, I have made in my lectures two contradictory statements. One statement that I made in the beginning was that during the, the black hole, uh, during the Hawking uh, radiation, these particles are produced in pairs which are highly entangled. That was, that's what follows from the calculation of Hawking. So according to the calculation of Hawking, all these particles which are produced are always entangled, so B is always entangled with C, right? But a little bit earlier, I, I made a small uh, drawing here where I said that after pairs time, the newly formed Hawking particles are entangled with the early radiation which represent the larger part of the Hilbert space. So I have made two statements about this particle B. I made the statement that it is entangled with C, and I also made the statement that if you are after pace time, it is entangled with the early radiation. But that is not okay because it, uh, it leads to a violation of monogamy of entanglement of, uh, in, in quantum mechanics. You cannot have a single quantum system simultaneously entangled with two other systems. And it, this can be made more precise by uh, writing down this uh, inequality, the strong subadditivity of entanglement entropy, uh, which is saying that if you have three systems, A, B, and C, and if you calculate the reduced density matrices, A, B, B, C, and the von Neumann entropies, they have to obey this inequality. It's, it's, it is a theorem in uh, quantum mechanics. And if we apply this theorem to this setup uh, for a black hole which is after the pace time, so it's an old black hole, uh, we are looking at the situation where uh, we're, we're taking A to be the early radiation and A, B means A together with B. It means it's the early radiation together with one more Hawking particle, right? Now, since we are in this part of the, of the graph where the entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation goes down, it, if we want to, to preserve unitarity, then it must be that S of A, B is less than S of A because the curve is going down, right? Otherwise, we would be still in the Hawking regime, right? So now the curve is going down. So SAB must be greater than SA. So, um, 
So after pay time, we need that SAB uh, is, sorry, SAB is less than SA. We need. However, this inequality is telling us something else. It's telling us that, uh, well, SAB is greater than uh, plus this guy, SA plus SC. Now, SC is the entropy of this, uh, this particle. According to Hawking, this is maximally entangled with B. So these guys together are in a pure state, according to Hawking. These are in a pure state. So SBC is zero, but SC is non-zero, it's positive. So this inequality is telling you that SAB plus zero is greater than SA plus a positive number. So it's telling you that SAB is greater than SA, which contradicts what we need to restore unitarity. Well, uh, this is a more precise statement of what I already said before, that it cannot possibly be that this B guy is at the same time entangled with uh, these two other systems. Now, you can ask, uh, well, what about all these small corrections that you were talking about before? I mean, th this, is, this statement that these guys are entangled is what follows from the calculation of Hawking, but we already said that we're going to consider corrections to the calculation. Uh, well, Matur uh, looked at this problem, so he uh, looked at what happens if you relax this condition a little bit by allowing these two guys to be not fully entangled, but a little bit away from maximal entanglement. And what he showed is that even if you introduce small corrections, this problem, this paradox, cannot be resolved. So, according to Hawking, so let's say, according to, can, can, yeah, according to Hawking, uh, B and C are together in a pure state. So SBC is equal to zero, right? But SB is not equal to zero, right? Because this particle is a thermal particle. And by symmetry, SC is not zero. So according to Hawking, SBC is zero and SC is positive, right? Well, if you look at this inequality, it predicts then that S of AB must be greater than S of A. But this is in contradiction to what you need in order for the, the Hawking radiation to become pure after phase time. If, S, if SAB was greater than SA, that would imply that as you take more and more Hawking particles and you add them to the Hawking radiation, the entanglement entropy of the radiation will keep increasing forever. So then this curve would go up uh, like what, what we saw before in the Hawking calculation. Well, what, this is what we need in order for, uh, to restore unitarity. Again? Yes. So it would be even worse, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, f so this is the, this paradox, uh, which shows that, uh, again, the difficulty in resolving the paradox uh, uh, becomes clear when you start uh, to, when you try to reconcile unitar unitary evaporation with, uh, with a horizon, which is the same as the one that Hawking uh, studied. And uh, again, you could say, all right, maybe there is some violation of this uh, subadditivity inequality, but perhaps there is no observer who can uh, detect it. But these authors uh, also try to work it out carefully and see that actually you can find an orbit of a ob time-like observer who can go through this cloud of radiation, the early radiation, and uh, fall into the black hole and intersect uh, B and C. So there's actually a single observer who can detect all these three systems and observe the violation of inequality. So in this paradox, you cannot say that maybe there's a violation, but there's no observer who can see it, because there is an observer who can, in principle, see it. OK, finally, there is one more problem, uh, which is more intuitive, maybe, but uh, it will be more precise in, uh, in ADS-CFT. Uh, <clears throat> when you look at the calculation of Hawking, uh, for, uh, between these two particles, uh, you find that they have to be highly entangled, but uh, not only that, they have to be entangled in a very precise state. 
very specific entangled state. So what I mean by that is that when you write down an entangled state, there are some coefficients that you write down. So you write, for instance, uh, if you write an EPR pair, you write uh, 0, 0 plus 1, 1 over square root of 2. This is an entangled state. But if you put a phase here, e to the i theta, uh, that is a different entangled state with the same amount of entanglement entropy. So all these states with different phases are different, different pure states. And uh, if you want to look at the calculation of, of Hawking, it predicts a very specific phase for all of these uh, coefficients. So th this seems to be uh, very peculiar from the point of view of statistical mechanics, because if you take a, a system and you divide two parts and you look at a typical state, then you can check that the pattern of entanglement between the two s subsystems uh, has some sort of random uh, behavior regarding these phases, for instance. And uh, so it's very difficult to imagine how dynamically typical states would end up having the correct entanglement needed for smoothness of the horizon. This can be made more precise uh, in ADSFT, where uh, now I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but I will explain that more tomorrow. Uh, there is a very standard example in ADSFT of the eternal black hole. We have two CFTs, uh, which are non-interacting, but they're in specific entangled state, the thermophile state. And the smoothness of the horizon depends on having the correct entanglement between uh, uh, the two sides. But uh, if you consider more general uh, typical states, not the so-called thermophile state, but more general states, you find that uh, these operators do not have the correct entanglement to describe this geometry. And uh, I will return to this slide tomorrow, so please don't, don't worry if it's not very clear. And also Schenker and Stanford studied the, uh, how perturbations, small perturbations, uh, can destabilize this entanglement due to the quantum, uh, to, to quantum chaotic effects. So if you send a small particle at early times, it uh, totally changes the nature of entanglement between these particles. So uh, it's very difficult to reconcile uh, this specific entanglement that we need according to the calculation of Hawking here with uh, the statistical properties of the system. Now, so the paradox came because we had these two particles that had to be entangled, uh, and also they had to be entangled, one of them had to be entangled with the early radiation. So if we want to preserve unitarity, uh, we have to respect the entanglement between uh, the new Hawking particles and the early radiation. So what if we give up on the entanglement between uh, the Hawking particles and the interior modes, the guys that we called C before? Then uh, you can check that this will create uh, a lot of problems uh, on the horizon. And the easiest way to convince yourself that that is the case is to consider Minkowski space in the Minkowski, so quantum field theory in the Minkowski vacuum and write the quantum field in, in Riegler coordinates. Uh, we can maybe do it later to, uh, during the discussion. And there you can see that, um, so you divide flat space into the right Riegler wedge, which is relevant for an accelerated observer, and uh, the left wedge. And here you have these Riegler horizons. And we know that these horizons are smooth because it's just Minkowski space after all. But then you can look at the quantum field in the ground state and you discover that this region is highly entangled with that region. So in particular, uh, well, we have drawn this, these wave packets which are very similar to the ones we had uh, inside the black hole. So an observer falling through this ring horizon experiences a free infall precisely because these two guys are entangled in the correct quantum state. So if you modify this entanglement, either by breaking the entanglement between the two sides completely, or if you modify the details of the entanglement, as I was trying to explain there, you generate some energy density on the horizon that you can explicitly calculate, because it's, 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 you can do it for a free field in four dimensions, for example, and you can calculate the stress tensor, uh, and you can see what different modifications of the entanglement, what effect they have on the stress tensor that you would detect when crossing the horizon. And uh, well, um, then in the case of the black hole, this would imply that uh, if we give up this entanglement with the interior partner, it would generate a very large stress tensor on the horizon, which would back react and modify the geometry in a, in a dramatic way. Now, uh, the problem here is that um, this uh, paradox and this uh, possibility uh, uh, becomes relevant after space time, right? It becomes relevant when the information start to come, start to, starts to come out of the black hole. And uh, by start, if we start off with a black hole of large enough mass, then we can make sure that even at pace time, the black hole is quite big. So this predicts the modifications of the nature of space time on the horizon, even for black holes which are macroscopic, which have a macroscopically large horizon, where classically, the curvature would be very low. So this predicts modifications of GR in a regime 
of uh, low curvatures, which would be very dramatic. Right? OK, I think I need to stop, right? So let me summarize. So I try to argue today that the information paradox from the point of view of an asymptotic observer has a natural resolution which is consistent with generic expectations of quantum statistical mechanics, namely that exponentially small corrections uh, to the observables that Hawking predicts can unitarize the radiation. I also try to explain that if you want to preserve the smoothness of the horizon, you run into more challenging problems uh, because you need very uh, fine-tuned entanglement between uh, the interior and the exterior, and this seems to contradict generic expectations from quantum statistical mechanics. Now, uh, my, my lectures so far have not been very precise, but uh, from tomorrow on, we will uh, uh, address all of these questions in the framework of ADCFT, where, as you will see, they will become significantly more precise because we will translate all of the statements into questions about the conformal field theory. So they will become mathematically more precise. Thank you.